I'm Maria Menunos, and you're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Perry Mason After Show, Episode 2, Chapter 2. Wow, this show, like I said last week, is not your grandpa's Perry Mason, and it just seems to get more and more heavy, deep, and, uh, you know, the conspiracies are coming, coming at us hard. Uh, I am your resident gumshoe and moderator, Sean McHugh, but I could not do this alone. I have some awesome partners in crime, pun intended. First of all, Erica Edwards, she's a fan of murder and mayhem. Hello, Erica. Hey, what's up, party people? <laughs> we also have a Hollywood history tour guide and host, Lauren Kling. Hello, Lauren. Hello, hello. And last but certainly not least, she loves all things HBO, Miss Alyssa Dickert. Hello, Alyssa. Hi, everyone. Well, this was uh, this was this was an intense uh, episode, guys. We had a lot going on. Let's just get overall thoughts to start out with, Lauren. I'm going to start with you. What were your overall thoughts on this episode? <laughs> I got lost already. Uh, <laughs> Like Game of Thrones, when there's a lot of things to have to figure out, my mind kind of shuts down and then I just look at the pretty pictures. So, uh, you know, I can follow a little bit what's going on. I know who the cast is by looking at them. But I will say, being a tour guide here in L.A., it was very cool and a fan of Tatiana Maslany. It was awesome to see her begin her role as Sister Alice. And I'm excited to share in my special segment who she's based off of. But, you know, I got to say that Perry Mason isn't just that nice little guy who solved crime in, from the 1950s and the 1980s version. This is a very different Perry Mason, Sean. And you and I can agree probably that he's got a past that we would have never, ever heard or known about when we watched the show back in the day or our parents watched the show. 100% agree, uh, Lauren. R this is not Raymond Burr, the clean cut and, you know, yeah. Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. No, 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 no. This guy's got a flawed past, and uh, we get to find out a little bit more every time. Uh, Alyssa, what were your thoughts overall on this episode? I really enjoyed it, but I see myself watching this and, like, trying to figure it out and trying to solve it, even though we're already on the second episode. But I think this one really opened up a lot about, you know, what possibly might be. So overall, I really enjoyed it. And of course, Erica, what were your overall thoughts? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I think sometimes they're, they drop the clues in ways, like you said, that make it, I should say, that make it easier to follow. And then other times I'm like, okay, wait, is he trying to find the thread? Like, you know, sometimes I don't even understand where he's trying to go. Mm. So that is a little bit interesting. And shout out for the Black people. Woo-hoo, because I don't remember that from the original. So I like that they have some strong African-American characters and they're showing a little bit of the racism and the police force and stuff. So it is actually getting pretty interesting, for sure. Awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree that there's a lot Sometimes I'm 100% with it. Other times I'm like, wait, where are we going here? I, I don't know, but I think that's going to be part of the fun of this journey. Uh, so let's just dive in. We start out with a flashback. And it's a very interesting because we've you know, they've hinted about that he's a, you know, he's a soldier or you know, a former soldier, that it didn't kind of end well. Um, but I thought for a second, I was like, wow, did they just borrow the 1917 set for this? Because this <laughs> looks amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. They, you know, HBO is not afraid to spend money on stuff. I mean, this is a flashback. That would, and I was very impressed with, like, the production value on this. Lauren, what were your thoughts on this kind of opening flashback? Well, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking. And, and also I thought, you know how there are actually uh, companies that rent out airplane interiors, for mm. all of the shows that are produced that take place inside an airplane, they must have a World War II set or <laughs> World War I set and, and they just re change the dirt and the broken <laughs> fences that are in it. Because that's exactly what I thought. I'm like, am I watching Dunkirk, Band of Brothers? Well, you know what? It's probably the Band of Brothers set that they pulled out of storage. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, but that leads to the part of learning something about Perry Mason we would have never, ever known 
about Raymond Burr when he played it, that Perry's uh, affected by uh, his experience in the war. And that kind of explains why he's just wanted to take pictures, salacious pictures of, of actors, because that's an easy gig, has nothing to do with what he saw in war. Now we mm. see why he's changing. Interesting. I like that. That almost like that those taking those pictures, like an escape from like his brain in a way. Right. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Uh, Erica, what were your thoughts on this whole kind of war flashback? Uh, I liked it. I thought it was an interesting open because you know, how HBO, well, I watch all my shows on HBO now, actually. So on the, on the app or whatever. So I'm like, Dang, this is the longest commercial ever. And then it took me a minute. I was like, oh, wait, this is part of the show. Oh, okay, okay, okay. There's there. And I'm like, how long is this going to run? Um, so I like that part of it. It seems like they're trying to push as to why was he dishonorably discharged? You know what I'm saying? So I thought that was an interesting uh, way, use of the flashback. And absolutely, it looks totally real i thought it was a different movie uh but i thought it was a really interesting way to give us some background as to why he's so dark of a perry mason so i enjoyed it nice uh Alyssa, they they kind of flash back throughout the episode mm -hmm. um and at, at one point we find out from mr baggerly that not only was he dishonorably be discharged but it's a very specific discharge and it's because either he was african-american or he was gay Mm -hmm. And he says to him, he says, I'm a quarter Welsh and queer only once. Um, it was a very interesting kind of reveal for me. What were your thoughts on, you know, overall on this flashback? But then in that moment, too, of like, where are we going with this? Yeah, it was like he was trying to catch him to to say something about himself. But I think it was more so because the attention was on him and he was trying to project it elsewhere because, you know, all this you know, his son had just gotten, you know, accused of conspiracy as well as, you know, we find out that his son was, you know, Ill illegitimate through someone, you know, he had it married, which is not good for back then, especially him being so involved in the church. So, I mean, I think that for me, I was like, well, I wonder what it is. I, w I wanted to know what he did. And then that is later revealed, which, um, which was definitely eye-opening too. Uh, okay, so let, so you kind of brought it up. Let, let's get into that. Like this whole thing of almost kind of this mercy killing going on in these flashbacks, right? Where instead of letting people just suffer through these horrible, you know, war injuries, just literally taking them out. And at one point I felt like there was a guy who was like, I I'm not quite ready to go out. And yeah. yet he kind of just made a decision for him. Uh, Lauren, I don't know, what were your thoughts on, this kind of other side of him that, you know, uh, we've, we're kind of slowly being a let, a, let to see. Well, it, it certainly informs the character where the, what the character is thinking. Uh, you know, again, we, I think we started with a, before the first episode, why are they remaking Perry Mason? Mm. So bes take out the fact that we know that name, this is turning, becoming a, really good detective story, a really good whodunit story that happens to take place in Los Angeles in the 1920s, 1930s. So um, <laughs> HBO is known for going this deep. And so I'm just kind of on the ride to okay. see what happens. It's funny. You almost think with characters who are, you know, have this many internal conflicts, how the heck are they ever going to get anything done? Solve a crime. I think that's how they're making this stretching this storyline out for multiple episodes because he's got to get through his own internal issues mm -hmm. along with solving this crime. Uh, that's a great point. A lot of times when we have, you know, detectives and cops, you know, like a la a la an order or something like that, we don't necessarily get their backstory. And you're right. Like it's all about solving the crime. And this is, we're really taking a deep dive with the people involved. So I'm with you. I, I think it's great, uh, you know, and if anybody's going to do it, HBO knows how. Mm -hmm. So uh, well said, sir. Well said. Um, all right. So we'll kind of move on down the line a little. We finally get to meet Sister Alice. Um, and I personally was very pleasantly surprised because when she had this whole speech in the beginning, you know, and she's giving this beautiful sermon, and I'm like, 
man, as soon as she walks off, she's going to 180 and be like, this is some BS. And like, I don't, you know, she doesn't believe any of it. Like I was ready for that moment. And then was very pleasantly surprised that no, no, no. She in fact is leaning into it. Like this is like a coming off from a real place. Alyssa, what were your thoughts when we met sister Alice? Yeah. I mean, I was like, wow, she knows definitely how to, how to, you know, work it. So, um, I really enjoy her character. I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing where it plays out. Something that stood out to me, like you mentioned, like when she, you thought that she was going to do a 180 when she, you know, was done the interaction she had with um, Emily when she Mm. held her hand and like made kind of like a face. I was like, she's getting some vibes here. So I feel like she knows something else is going on or has some sort of connection to all this. Well, great minds think alike, Alyssa, because I was on the same wavelength. I said, ooh, she like she's on some next level stuff, like almost, <laughs> you know, savant in a way that like she I think she knows what really happened. Erica, what are your thoughts? What what was your impression of Sister Alice? Uh, I really enjoyed watching Sister Alice and honestly, the whole interaction between sort of the elders of the church mm. And sort of, you know, we get to see a little bit um, back story behind these figures in the church. And uh, one particular character where she was, um, I think that was her mother. So I thought it was really interesting where she kept referring to her like, yes, mother. And then the mother would be like, yes, Sister Alice. So I thought that whole sort of dynamic between, you know, borderline cult culture, um, I thought that was really interesting to watch. Uh, awesome. And now I know Lauren, you're going to get in your special segment, you're going to get, you know, a lot deeper into this subject, but I want to get your thoughts on, obviously you're a very a big fan of this actress as well. Uh, what, what were your thoughts and impressions of sister Alice? Um, you know, what you kind of brought up with her kind of seeing that look and knowing something was up that was like, Ooh, this is good. <laughs> this is really good. And also the fact that off camera or off rate mic, she's the same person. Mm. So we we're being informed of her fully fleshed out life that sister Alice has, that it's not just on camera, off camera kind of thing. Uh, I'm excited one because I think Tatiana Maslany did an amazing job with Orphan Black playing uh, uh, 40, 50 different characters. Mm. And so... <laughs> In a way, I'm like, is this just another one of the same thing? I'm curious, though, to see, because I'm curious to see the the religious aspect of this storyline, how religion plays. Um, you know, Perry Mason, we wouldn't necessarily think he's a religious man. Yet we've got the, you know, we've got a, a, a fight between the religion and who's under its control and the head of the LA police department and who's under their control. Does that make sense? Yeah. A hundred percent. No, I'm, 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 I'm with you. It's uh, it's all very insidious, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I think it's, you know, I think it always has been and probably always will be uh, that all the powers that be kind of work together to keep themselves as the powers that be. Um, So yeah, it's a good observation and uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of plays out, but I don't, I don't think any, I don't think it's going to play out well for them. I think we're going to get, they're going to get revealed and not that it's going to come crashing down per se, but uh, I think there's going to be some, some repercussions for, for, for what, what's all gone down. Um, she actually at the, at the end of the episode, she gets into, she kind of puts everybody on blast, you know, in a way of like, really like honestly saying that, you know, all these high officials, they all have the good seats and never seen them before, probably never going to see them again. And, you know, mom, uh, not too excited about this sermon. Alyssa, what were your thoughts on this, uh, this kind of blasting sermon? Yeah, I was, especially because it was for the, for Charlie too. I thought that that Mm. was like, you know, I mean, I, I thought it was great that she was kind of, you know, just speaking her truth because it's, her you know she's the one that runs it but at the same time it was that was kind of shocking to me too um another thing that I noticed was the eye contact between her and Perry Mason which kind of like linked that do they know each other do they not know each other um that was also interesting to me like right after her mom said that 
That's a great point because I remember in the first episode, he grabbed the picture uh, of the Dobson's house of her and kind of looked at her a little longer than maybe you would have. So I think you might be onto something there. There's a connection there. Uh, I didn't necessarily put that together. I noticed the, the, the look, but I didn't think too hard about it. So I love that you brought that up. Um, Erica, they, uh, Alyssa talked about, you know, uh, Sister Alice kind of talking her truth. And it's very interesting to me because I think she's kind of the purest form of this, of whatever this religion and this, this kind of church is. I think she's the pureness of it. And of course she has all these people around her, the elders kind of trying to finagle it so that we can make money. We can be a thing. Uh, what were your thoughts on, on this kind of sermon and just overall on her? Uh, overall, I thought it was interesting because, uh, to me, it still has like a cult vibe. Mm. And I, what I thought interesting about it was in the beginning, you're right. She made these comments about the mayor and the district attorney or whatever, but I felt like at the end, she got the community riled up in support of them. So, and talking Mm. about how they were going to smite the devil. So to me, I felt like she was giving sort of a clue as to basically she's the one with the power so Mm. she can have either have the people for you or against you depending on which way she wants to go so that's i thought it was interesting to see how kind of how much control she had basically over her huge congregation i guess Mm -hmm. oh okay i love that Uh, i feel like i feel like you want to say something there lauren did you have a thought (laughs) well not to reveal too much for the special segment, but uh, Sister uh, Sister Alice is based off a real character, uh, Amy Simple McPherson, who let who created a sense of community to appeal to different people, people who are are searching, who are looking for answers, mm. appealing to the lonely, appealing to the destitute and the displaced, the forgotten. And so I think that's her power is she knows she's got the pulpit and she's got, I don't want to say an army, but she's got a base of people who are following her and believe her and she can kind of lead them in a direction she'd like to take them. Okay. Yeah, I I agree with all that. And Erica, I like the kind of you said that there is a a cult vibe going on here because, I mean, that meeting definitely, I mean, with the way, just the way they had the people with the the, the, the sins draped on them. And then it was the seven things that can redeem you. So it was all, yeah, it definitely had a, a cult vibe going. And it's interesting because, you know, these things are not new. Like we think cults and all this stuff. And it's like, no, it's, it's been going on for a while. And I think there's a fine line between cult, church, religion, you know, it's, it's, and I think there may be, we're, we're getting some kind of social commentary on it as well of, 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 you know, what that fine line is and, you know, where, where it goes bad, possibly. Mm-hmm. So let's kind of move on here. Uh, we have we find out kind of a big plot point that turns out that Matthew Dodson is also the illegitimate son of Herman Baggerly. So this is a huge reveal. Um, and then this course makes this whole kidnapping gone wrong even crazier to me and deeper. Uh, Alyssa, what were your thoughts on finding out about this and, and where we're going? Yeah, I mean, now I'm like, oh, that makes sense as to why he was so concerned about making sure that outside of LAPD was helping in this case. Um, And I just thought also that it was really interesting, too, that kind of hearing more about the dynamic between them, how he they it seemed like it was pretty recent, um, which was interesting, as well as the. What did he say? I just like lost my train of thought about um, him just finding the church. Like we said we could have a relationship because he said that he was going to go back to church, which I thought was even more like telling of kind of how the church might be involved in some way, you know? So it was, it was a shock to me definitely that that happened. Yeah. uh, You know, the cops kind of reveal that, you know, it didn't make, didn't quite make sense that they're trying to get a hundred grand out of this grocery store mm-hmm. owner. And it's like, oh, he's actually got deeper pockets than initially we thought. Uh, Erica, what were your thoughts on, on this reveal? And, you know, how do you feel about Baggerly? Uh, you know, is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? What's going on there? Uh, well, a couple things. One, 
Although I didn't predict it, I wasn't really that surprised by it, honestly, because, you know, um, and initially you do have to think, okay, if they can, if they kidnap their child, what would lead them to believe that this person would come up with the money? And how would they know that someone else in the church was going to pay it? So, you know, so it wasn't really that surprising, but I liked the way it was done. Um, I always thought from the beginning that Baggerly was probably both good and bad. So, you know, so I do feel like uh, even though he's hired these people to assist his son, that doesn't necessarily mean he couldn't also be behind it, really. So I have to I have to jump in with Robert Patrick, the actor. He'll always be a Terminator to me. (laughs) And so so Erica, right when you said it that we don't know, you know, if he's good or bad. To me, it's hard to pull out one of his most iconic roles out of this one. So I've always wondered, is he good or is he bad? Who's he got hiding under that outer skin? Mm. Exactly. I agree. <laughs> uh, I he's, molten, he's molten metal is basically what I'm trying to say. Right, right. <laughs> um, we have uh, we have this interesting, uh, you kind of touched on it earlier, Erica, uh, we have this 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 interesting uh, black character comes in, uh, who's you know we we he's introduced as a kind of a peace officer, you know just kind of a beat cop, but then quickly gets involved with this investigation because something went down in his neighborhood. So he discovers some stuff, and then we also see that you know he's not just your regular beat cop that, you know he's got a head on his shoulders and he quickly follows clues to find out what's really going on here. Uh, so he goes to the, obviously brings all this information. And then we have this interesting scene, which, uh, unfortunately I don't think we've necessarily evolved from as a society, uh, at all, but of this weird thing where the cops are like, I'm like, are they complimenting him? Or are they harassing him? I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Obviously they're happy to have the information, but there it's just this weird kind of vibe going on. Lauren, what were your thoughts on that whole thing? Uh, you know, it, it especially in this time, it's it's hard to see where where the story goes when it comes to race relations, uh, and especially in a police department that was known to be so corrupt at that time. So, you know, it's hard to know what's real, what's fantasy. I do love the character of Officer Paul, Paul uh, Officer Drake. Um, but the fact that that he's the one that discovered the twin murders brings him into the fold. And I'm curious to see because he uh, I'm curious to see where he's going to go. What kind of what kind of life he's led up to this point that we don't know about. We, we saw him kind of uh, settle the argument between the husband and wife. And so I'm. I'm curious, but, and then he comes into the police station. And he, I think he was harassed. I, so, you know, I don't know how he's going to earn his respect if that's what we're hoping or expecting to happen. Okay. Yeah. It was weird. Like there was some, definitely some kind of backhanded compliments along, along the way, that whole situation, uh, Erica, but we do see that he's, he seemed like, uh, Lauren had touched on kind of seems to be like almost a pillar of the community. Like he knows who everybody is. Uh, and he knows that like this was not a normal thing for his neighborhood. Um, but I, I I was hoping we were going to get it. I think we'll get it eventually. I was hoping we were going to get this episode, him and Perry meeting, because I think they're going to team up at some point. What were your what were your thoughts on him? Um, yeah, I agree with you. I feel like they're setting him up to sort of be Perry Mason's sidekick, because I think the original character, uh, I forgot his last name the one who he owes money to, because we did see him in this episode as well. He, you know, in the original series, Perry Mason does have this detective, this investigator in every, you know, but that was the 50s. So that person obviously wasn't black. So I feel like this character is actually going to end up being his real sidekick throughout the season or, you know, and maybe throughout the series, actually. Awesome. Love it. Yeah, I look forward to seeing this guy. It's funny. I, I just saw him in uh, When They See Us, uh, this, ah, act, okay. this actor, and he was great in that. So I'm as soon as he came on, I was like, oh, I like this guy. I'm excited now. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, we also have, turns out that not only is Mr. Dobson uh, a little shady, 
So is Mrs. Dobson, Emily. She's having an of or was having this an affair. I mean, we got letters, we got phone calls, which is always interesting on the old timey phone these days to me. <laughs> um, Alyssa, what were your thoughts on this reveal of Emily? Yeah, um, I mean, when Perry went into that house, I knew I was like, oh, this isn't gonna be good. But that was. I don't know if it was surprising to me because as soon as like he had found out that she was always on the phone, I was like, okay. And that she was trying to call people, you know, I was like, who is this character going to be? Um, and then when it was revealed who it was, and then we found the letters, I was like, okay, well, she's not as innocent as she's been, you know, trying to lead on, but I kind of already had felt that in the first episode. So I'm just interested to see like what in it just, he's dead now. And so it's only up to, you know, her to find out all the information. She obviously wasn't being honest with Perry. So it's going to be interesting to find out kind of how this relationship started, you know, that alligator farm tie into what that's all about. But um, when he saw the dead body and um, that note, I was like, okay, well, this, uh, my immediate reaction to that was like, this doesn't seem like someone would, would place that like that with this going on. Mm. I have some nerdy info about that alligator farm, by the way. Oh, really? I was wondering <laughs> if it was real. <laughs> yeah, so from 1907 to 1953, there was the Los Angeles alligator farm in uh, Lincoln Heights neighborhood, next door to the Los Angeles ostrich farm. Oh, oh wow. If you know wow. where that is. <laughs> uh, love it. Well, so so Lauren, since you, you jumped in, let's, let's stick with you for now. It's interesting to me how we think of the paparazzi being this kind of fairly new phenomenon. But we, as we saw with Emily trying to just get to a car, like the press was all over her. And it's a, funny too, like literally hopping in these old timey cars and like chase, <laughs> like, like, like nothing's changed. It's all the same. Yeah. Um, so we have Perry following her because, you know, he doesn't trust it. Um, and I love that. I love when we, the, the reveal of technology of the time, he gets in a phone booth and ask about a reverse book, right? Like to, to find out what the address of this phone number is. Like, so the whole way, talk a little bit about that because you're our historian. And I also want to say, I think that diner was Musso and Frank's. Am I correct on that? Oh, you know what? You might be right. You might be right. The, okay. uh, the church that Sister Alice is at is, uh, I have it somewhere in my notes, but that's also Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but to your question, as far as technology, uh, I don't know everything. I don't know a lot about phone technology back then. <laughs> um, however, it is cool. Uh, why am I blanking on who is the, the, the cartoon character that used to have like the watch the, the wristwatch. Oh, like, like Inspector Gadget? Oh, Inspector. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, not Inspector Gadget, but that's funny you bring up Inspector Gadget hat on kind of the old timey kind of detective thing. Right. Um, I, I like staring at old technology and the way it's used because some of it were like, I remember that back in the day. And some of it, you know, even us were like, what is that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Erica, what about you? I mean, you know, this kind of this paparazzi phenomenon and then, you know, this this interesting technology that, you know, the way they have to kind of go about things. What what are your thoughts on some of that? Uh, I think the paparazzi, I like that section of it because I do. It does seem like back in those days, especially in Los Angeles, headlines and the newspapers were, you know, had so much power and authority to sway how people thought about things and babies being kidnapped, et cetera. Uh, I kind of feel kind of like with his telephone, with his um, camera, I feel like some of it is for our benefit. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like, I'm not sure, not saying there's not a reverse book. <laughs> I feel like some of it is more for us to kind of not be totally uncomfortable with <laughs> the time period. It's because it's kind of modern yet not. Like I know, you know, you can't call you know, like operator hooked me up with some like, just call the operator back. But uh, so I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I'm not sure if there's a reverse book, but let me know. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say hi to the people out in the chat. Yes. Uh, shout out to you guys. Looks like there's six people watching. So feel free to like uh, and also make comments, you guys, so we can see your shout out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yes. Love the chat. Thank you for watching. 
Um, well, kind of, we're kind of wrapping it up here as far as the episode. Uh, so after it all kind of goes down, we have the funeral, and then we have uh, we have Perry, uh, who's meeting uh, meeting oh the lawyer guy um, John Lithgow. His character, his name is escaping e. me right now. Elias. Yes, thank you, E B yeah. E B. So we have they're in this. And is this the L A? Maybe you can help me with this, Lauren. Is this the L A. Country Club? Not L A. Country. The L A. Uh, what is the swim club or what is the thing uh, downtown? Hey. Oh, oh, you know what? I was thinking of the Hollywood Athletic Club. Yes, um, that's what I'm thinking of. Yes. In Hollywood, yeah. Is that where is that where we're at for this? Yeah, yeah, I I think so. Again, okay. it's it's sometimes hard to to know, but but definitely uh, that was in existence, and that was an exclusive club to be in. I think that's the vibe yeah. I got, and I and I couldn't put it all, but thank you. That's why you're our resident historian. <laughs> so thank you for for that. Um, so we're we're at the end of the episode, and they're in there, and Perry says, uh, "I don't like it here." And then EB says to him, we do what we don't want, what we don't like when there's a greater good to be served. You, of anybody, should know that. And that's this kind mm. of, and he kind of leaves this very ominous kind of thing, which then leads to this ominous ending, which I was utterly confused by. I felt like I don't know where we were going at the end of this. It just kind of ended. Alyssa, what were your thoughts on this whole kind of end of this episode? Yeah, I mean... It definitely was revealed as to why he got that blue ticket, um, the dishonorable discharge. Um, but I don't know. I mean, that ending, I was like, oof, this didn't leave, this didn't make me feel good at the end, you know, end of it. But, you know, in that situation too, like, what was he supposed to do? We find out that he was the captain, right? And, you know, he had all of his men there. They had to leave. It's either they were gonna get, you know, gassed or whatever or he was just going to put them out of their misery. So it's like, it like definitely made me think like, well, did he do what he was supposed to like, you know, like what would you guys have done? You know, it was just, it just made me think. And I don't know what you guys thought about it, but. Uh, Erica, you look like you got something to say. What's going on? <laughs> no, I, um, yeah, I thought the ending was really interesting in that, you know, when they show him shooting everyone, I guess, you know, in theory, I guess, to take them out of their misery or whatever. And then someone sees him doing it. So it must mm -hmm. be one of those things where it's like, okay, um, you know, obviously he probably got court um, marshaled for it, etc. So it's an interesting way to see like, okay, he was just discharged. And um, so I don't know, I think it did give us a deeper perspective into him. And I also feel like the way he handled Emily, um, that his wife must have probably cheated on him as well because he seemed like he was a little really aggressive with her actually like kind of more than it really needed to be he seemed a little extra to me on that part in that particular scene with her so um i thought it was really interesting and then you know emily's arrest so i think they kind of left you wanting more for sure love it i love that that that, that connection you made about maybe his wife did the same yeah. thing because you're right. He kind of flipped on I me mean, because he was so gentle and nice with her before, but once he found out what happened, man, he flipped 180. Lauren, just some final thoughts on this ominous ending. Like, and then to, to Alyssa's point, what would you have done? <laughs> Jeez. You know, we all make decisions in life. Sometimes we have the benefit of time and sometimes we don't. And then we have to live with those decisions. And then when somebody else sees you making that decision, but has no idea what your thought process was, uh, boy, that sounds like uh, social media today. Um, <laughs> and reaction time too, where people are today are able to react before thinking. So, you know, it's, it's hard. And I, I breathe heavily and I sigh because I don't want to say I look back to that time period as boy, they didn't have to worry about, you know, having social media and being judged right away. But boy, though, making those kind of decisions wouldn't have been any easier. Well said, sir. Well said. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to our special segment, our in-house historian, Mr. Lauren Kling. Please take it away. Oh, oh, me, me. Got it. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> so we know Tatiana Maslany is playing sister Alice McKeegan of the uh, Radiant Assembly of God. I would say she's inspired uh, by the real-life religious leader, Amy Semple McPherson of the International Church of the Square, Four Square Gospel. Founded in 1923, built a temple called Angelus Temple, 
mm. that si sa uh, sat 5,300 people. For those of you out there who are watching who are from Los Angeles or know the area, it's still today the building is right across the street from Echo Park Lake, kind of a, a, a curvy building. And there's a Burger King down the block, which was not there. <laughs> but just to give you an idea, it's it's uh, uh, paralleled on one side by the 101 freeway and the lake and then that building. Uh, in the 20s and 30s, it emerged as one of the city's most prominent institutions. Um McPherson was a master of technology and popular media, as we kind of saw. Uh, charitable support, theatrical ministrations. She had a weekly Sunday parade through the streets of L.A., along with the mayor movie stars, and they would be led directly to the temple, probably with the stop of the Burger King nearby. <laughs> <laughs> and um, also, if you have ever visited downtown L.A., you may have looked up uh, at a building on Broadway and seen two old school uh, style radio towers with uh, KRKD letters mm. on them. That was actually that was uh, those towers were used to send out the signal from the Foursquare Church for a time period. Oh, okay. wow. 1924 KFSG meaning four square gospel, bought the towers. During the day, they would just run secular programming, but from 6 p.m. to 12 midnight would be uh, ministry from the church. Wow, very nice. So kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah very interesting. And I've, I, quick side note, I've actually attended a church service at Angelus Temple. Oh, uh, got it. <laughs> it was not, it was not uh, obviously... Miss McPherson's service, but um, but no, I've been there, and it's quite a powerful, quite a powerful building to be in. Uh, so very cool, very cool. Yeah. And then, do we have uh, some news? Yes, we do. Um, so, will there be a second season of Perry Mason? Mm. That is kind of the speculation that I've seen in a couple different articles um, online, and you know how I said last week the show had the strongest debut for any HBO series in almost two years that number was 1.7 million viewers so that's like a that was pretty strong i haven't seen what the numbers were uh for this second episode but um as we've been saying you know this reboot kind of focuses on mason's backstory before becoming an attorney um but there's no confirmation yet on if there will be a second season but as we know also you know, there's a lot of material to go with, a lot of mysteries to be solved just based on um, Earl Stanley Gardner, who wrote 80 novels from 1933 to 1969. And he also wrote four Perry Mason, Mason short stories. Mm. Um, and the original series ran for almost a decade. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like there's been, I've been seeing a lot of positive feedback just two episodes in. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a second season. I don't know what your guys' thoughts are on that. Uh, I think it's interesting because, well, one, obviously, like, I think it would be a thing where there'd be one mystery for the season, right? Mm -hmm. That we would kind of right. lead up. Like, it seems like that's what we're doing with this season um, so that it, you wouldn't necessarily have to watch every season. You know, you could be, they could be independent. Um, but man, it's so funny with everything going on with COVID and everything. I, like, I just, that's all, all I'm seeing now is all the reasons you can't like make, make movies anymore because um. like. The, yeah, you have to true. be intimate with people like you have to be on top of each other and you have to be like in each other's faces and you know it's uh and then like the, the, the put the period stuff on top of it all it's like a whole yeah. other level so i don't it'll be very interesting to see how production goes you know moving forward That's a good point, uh, yeah. so i don't i don't know uh all right let's go final kind of thoughts and predictions uh, Erica, let's start with you. You look like you got something to say again. <laughs> I don't know why I look like that, but um, <laughs> okay. So for my predictions, one, I don't think Emily did it. Of course, I want to say almost obviously. Um, two, I feel like uh, whoever, I think someone hired George to get into a relationship with her and kind of put this in motion. Mm. Oh, I think it's likely to either be um, the father, Baggerly or whatever, or someone in the church um, to kind of get rid of their scenario. Uh, so yeah, so we'll see. I think it might be the father. And oh, also I think he hired Perry Mason because of his bad background. Because mm. to me, I feel like if you know someone has 
you know, doesn't have it together, you may think you have more control over what they do and what they put out there. Love it. Love it. Lauren. Uh, I kind of am agreeing with Erica that the first episode, she seemed nice and, and, you know, she just lost her child. Then this episode, we learn more of her background. I think it might be a redirection to get us to think, oh, it must be her, but who it is. I don't know. Just because I love Stephen Root, I'm going to blame it on Maynard Barnes for everything. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Alyssa. Yeah, I think that uh, Erica brought up a lot of good points. But um, also, I think that Baggerly probably had more to do with it that maybe we'll find out later on. Um, is it Officer Drake who found like the teeth at the end, kind of towards the mm. end of the episode? Those look similar to the ones at the house, the Perry Mason, George's. So I'm wondering if there's a connection. I'm just kind of waiting mm. for Perry Mason and Officer Drake to randomly cross paths or something, because I do think what Erica was saying about him potentially being the sidekick, I think that that might come to fruition. Um, and yeah, I don't think that Emily did it, but she may have known a little bit something potentially. Uh, I love I love everybody's predictions. I'm pretty much on board with everything. Uh, I'm going to throw this bomb at everybody. I'm going to say that the baby is not Mr. Dobson's. I'm going to say that it might be someone else's baby, and which is start, which is why this whole thing, this whole train got started. Mm. So I'm just going to throw that out there. I have no idea. I might be talking out of you know wherever, but that's going to be my prediction. <laughs> All right. Well, that is going to do it. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you to those in the chat. Please like, subscribe, do all the things. And then Alyssa, where can we find you? Yes, just at Alyssa Dickert on Twitter and Instagram. Mr. Kling. Yes, you can find me on Instagram at, at Lauren Kling. Erica. You can follow me on all of my social media at Erica, E-R-I-K-A, D as in door, Edward. Awesome. And I am Sean Star 75 on the gram. Gorilla Suit Sean on Twitter. And you can also find me on the Council of Dads this Friday at 7, the season finale, and actually, unfortunately, series finale. So check us out there. Oh. Check out all our shows on After Buzz and anything you like. We pretty much got an after show for it. So go check it out. And until next week, we will see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principal.